Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. Bedford's cost segregation specializes in generating significant tax savings via their engineering-based studies for commercial real estate clients nationwide. Founded in 2002, Bedford is one of the largest independently owned cost segregation providers in the country with over 14,000 studies completed to date in multiple offices throughout. The most important decision ownership can make when incorporating cost segregation within their real estate portfolio is selecting the right provider. With only 43 certified cost segregation professionals nationwide, Bedford is proud to employ eight of them and takes the quality of their people as seriously as their studies. Every certified cost segregation professional has passed a rigorous test combining knowledge of technical engineering issues, legal tax issues, ethics standards, and requires a strict level of prior work experience to be eligible. Bottom line, not all cost segregation providers are created equal. So be sure to take the decision seriously from the beginning to protect yourself for years to come. Please contact Bedford's Business Development Director, Frank Judici, to learn more. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Kevin Long. Thanks for being on the show, Kevin. Thank you, Whitney, and thanks for having such a fabulous show. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate you being here. Uh, Kevin was the founding principal broker and COO of CBC Advisors until Colliers International acquired CBC Advisors in 2017. In 2017, Kevin co-founded Mill Creek Commercial, whose mission is to bring the safety, security, and stability of premium commercial real estate to every investor. And we want to hear today how he's done that and get some tips on, on what he's done and, and how he helps those investors. Uh, Kevin, why don't you give us a little background on your real estate journey and just uh, uh, you know, what you're doing right now, what you know, Mill Creek's focus is. Well, it, it's been an interesting journey and, and I, you know, I could speak for the entire show on just my journey, but I came from being an a economic development consultant and political consultant uh, into commercial real estate. A fellow by the name of Brandon Fugel uh, brought me over to the dark side. Uh, he was the founder. He's, he's one of the premier national commercial real estate executives in the world today. And uh, he brought me over to a company called Coldwell Banker Commercial when I was an economic development professional. He said, hey, you've got great ideas. You should get paid for them. So I uh, came over and I got into the brokerage community. That was 1998. Uh, then in 2013, Brandon and a group of other individuals acquired uh, the Coldwell Banker Commercial franchise in Salt Lake City from Realogy, the largest commercial are the largest real estate company in the world. They own a number of brands. But we acquired that franchise. Uh, I stepped out of brokerage, became the principal broker and chief operating officer, partnered with Brandon, and we uh, grew the Salt Lake City office of Coldwell Banker Commercial into a 30 office national brand, CBC Advisors. We became first the largest uh, franchise, Coldwell Banker Commercial franchise in the world then we actually became larger than Realogy's holdings of Coldwell Banker Commercial. Uh, And then along came Collier's. Uh, Collier's needed to be in the Intermountain West, our home area, where we were very strong. So now my son, uh, Adam, runs the uh, Collier's operations here in the Intermountain West. I took the intellectual property that would become Mill Creek Commercial uh, and stepped away and said, I want to kind of go into semi-retirement. I want to invest my money and uh, partners' money uh, the way I've learned, a conservative. uh, We we use the word safety, security, stability a lot, uh, and that's how we invest. So I invest in commercial real estate that I want in a very conservative uh, real estate portfolio for my retirement and my partner's retirement. And then we'll allow uh, people to come in and and purchase a portion of the properties that we own uh, as a tenant in common and take, if they buy 10% of a Walgreens, they get to own 10% of that income stream. So it's very conservative. It's, um, 
featured, you know, it, yeah, anyway, that's what I do. Nice. Now I want to get into that a little bit. It's an interesting story how people get to where they're at, you know, in the real estate business. Uh, I know when I was uh, much younger, I, I never, I never even imagined owning any piece of real estate didn't know this was a thing. So uh, it's just interesting and you've been very successful at it. So grateful to have you on the show again. You know, tell us a little more about, uh, you know, who your focus is and how you help investors to be able to partner in these types of deals. Um, you know, so, and, and, and love to get into just the structure of that too, as you know, them being a, a part of a, a tenant in common or tick. Yeah. So we focus on two types of investors. Uh, our, our product is specifically designed for uh, uh, retirement accounts and for 1031 exchange investors to large pools of money that typical syndications are not uh, qualified for. Uh, because to be in a uh, uh, 1031 exchange, you can't come into an LLC or a special purpose entity. Uh, and uh, to be part in, in a retirement portfolio, uh, you can't have any debt that is not that, that, that is not non-recourse, right? So we uh, have designed a product uh, that fits both of those pools of money, and that's what we market to. Nice. Well, you know, can you tell, speak a little bit to then how you are uh, maybe meeting investors that are needing that 1031 exchange and how, maybe how you kind of coach them through that process a little bit? Yeah. So we have a, a, uh, a marketing machine. I, you know, I, I like to call it air support with a nuclear arsenal. So we really try to target in, for our 1031 investors, uh, the people that are in what I call the 90 days of pain. So in a 1031 exchange, you have uh, 45 days to identify your replacement property and the IRS has no forgiveness whatsoever. Um, so I, I feel like when someone puts your property under contract, you got 45 days till they're gonna close. And then you got 45 days after that to identify. So we call it the 90 days of pain. And all of a sudden you can't sleep at night. It's like, oh my gosh, I've realized I talked to my tax advisor and this million dollar piece of property that I'm selling, I'm going to have to pay $300,000 in taxes. And I mean, I plan to just put it in the, in the stock market and have a nice safe return. But now I don't have a million dollars. I have 700,000 and I got to take a riskier approach. Uh, and so you just start losing sleep. And, and then we come along and say, hey, why don't you invest in 20% of a Walgreens with 15 years left on the lease? And it pays you 6% interest or 5.75. Or take a, a little more riskier approach. Uh, risk is, is really relative in our realm right. because we focus on, on just done deals. There's no speculations with corporate guarantees. But, you know, maybe not an investment grade tenant that's paying six and a quarter with a 20 year lease. Um, so we do a lot of that kind of product. You can see what we do and how we coach people at our website, millcreekcommercial.com. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So could you just walk us through a few of those steps there, how that works? Is, are these properties that you already own and someone can come and purchase shares of it, you know, or, or yeah. is it something you have under contract? When does that happen? Yeah. So I like to call it a reverse syndication. So uh, my partner and I go out and buy the properties, all cash. We use all our money. We buy them. Uh, we take the approach of we're buying a property that if if COVID happened tomorrow and nobody else wanted it, then it's our property for our retirement portfolio. So that's the approach we take. So we uh, have been very, very blessed because of that approach. Uh, we buy very conservative, uh, Amazon resistant, uh, recession proof properties. Um, and then we have a separate third party company who kind of functions as the escrow. Uh, and, um, and then we buy, we sell percentage interests in those properties. Now you use the term partner. We, uh, uh, the IRS specifically disallows us from using that term uh, because if you're a partner, then that smells like an LLC. And if it's an LLC, it's not 1031 qualified. So we have co-owners. 
uh, they come in and they own the property with us and they, they own their whatever percent. You know, Kevin, I know a lot of operators that will steer away from 1031s because of having to do the tenant in common and having to give really too much control potentially to someone else. How do you all steer around that? Uh, I'm not a control freak. So uh, it really is a co-owner relationship. Uh, but I'm also very experienced in real estate. I've seen just about every deal go great and every deal go into the toilet, right? And, I, and so what, uh, what we, the toughest thing we had to overcome when we decided this model would work was the, exactly what you just said, people wanna steer away from a tenant in common because of the headaches and the issues. And so we, we identified what those problems were, uh, what has historically been issues with tenant in commons, and we avoid those issues like a plague. We just, we just don't go there. We stay very conservative, uh, we have four pillars that we, that we stay true to, and that's, um, that's our secret sauce. What are your all's or, or your thoughts just on the, how the election might affect, say, 1031 exchange or, uh, you know, or moving forward? Well, 1031 exchange has been a controversial section of tax code ever since my good friends, the Starker family, manipulated Section 1031 to involve delayed exchanges back in the 1960s and 1970s. I've done seminars on this. Uh, I, I grew up in Oregon. I know the Starker family. Uh, I, I know all the background to 1031 exchange, but let's just shorten it to say Section 1031 uh, as it is used today, it is only used today for real estate. That's its only purpose in the tax code, right? It was initially put forth in the tax code in 1921 to help manufacturers and, and uh, excavation companies, you know, to, who go out and buy a backhoe, uh, and then they need to replace that backhoe to be able to do that without repaying the capital gains or, or getting the capital gains or repaying the depreciation. So, um, now it's used in real estate, never its original intent. It's the only law in the books that was, was never really passed by Congress for its original intent. And the, uh, the section or the, the federal agency that oversees it, the IRS, hates it. They were forced into it, and, and that's a really cool story in and of itself. Uh, and so they hate it. Uh, and so we're always in a fight to keep it. We had to, we had to fight to keep it uh, in the Trump administration because the Republican Congress wanted to uh, trade it for opportunity zones. It made sense to trade it. And my partner and I, uh, my partner, Luke Kramer, who is just a political savant, relationship savant, and knows just about everybody in Washington, D.C., got the personal commitment from then President Pro Tem of the Senate Orrin Hatch to save it for real estate, uh, and we did. Uh, and so now uh, the Biden administration is advancing uh, concepts to eliminate it. But the argument to keep it is really, really strong. And uh, so I, I think we'll prevail uh, in preserving it. We have in the past, uh, I think we will moving forward. But it, it is a, a serious concern. So, you know, just with your, your level of experience in this industry, what can you speak to just how your, um, you know, your uh, investment portfolio has, has performed, say, over the last, you know, six to eight months, uh, you know, coming up to the virus, say, in March, but then, you know, post, uh, you know, March as well, what's kind of happened and what you all see moving forward? Well, we have a... Uh, a really robust research department. When you invest with us, it's like investing with the Uber, uh, as the Uber wealthy would invest because, um, you know, the, a, a number of high net worth companies uh, and families that if I used their name, you would know, uh, have used our, our tools uh, to, in their own family funds, right? So, uh, so you get a, a deep, robust uh, research department. You know, we have a Rhodes Scholar finalist. We have an MBA. We have an economist. Uh, you know, we have, uh, we just have a, a really strong research department. And those people are, are 
COVID-19 showed us how dang good they are. Uh, of our, I think about 20 properties that we had in our portfolio, we had one problem and it was a hotel. Oops, right? Uh, you can imagine uh, the, the problems that, fa that face. But then it's, it's an obvious problem. So our co-owners are able to go, yeah, this isn't, I mean, this isn't a misrepresentation. This obviously is a problem. But because we do everything debt-free, um, our, 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 we're facing our worst case scenario with that property. And that is we have to not take rent for a few months while it recovers, right? But if we give support to our tenant, he'll recover, life comes back. And because we're not servicing a debt, we don't come to a crisis. So that's the yeah, benefit of that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. You do not have to worry about that. Uh, so you know, what do you see, you know, happening over the next six to 12 months, uh, just in the real estate uh, market? I know a lot of the listeners who are who are passive investors, but also operators are, you know, always contemplating, should I sit on the sidelines for a while? Should I be a buyer right now? Should I wait? Uh, you know, what's what's your perspective? Well, frankly, I was uh, quite surprised um, at how the 1031 exchange market has, has moved. Um, when, the, uh, when the COVID outbreak first occurred back in March, uh, the federal government, I think in early April, extended all deadlines to July 15th. And I thought, wow, we're going to get a big rush in July. And then we won't have any more business the rest of the year, right? Um, uh, because everybody will stop selling, but that has not happened. People are still engaging in real estate. We're still able to find people in that 90 days of pain. They still need some place that's safe, stable, and secure to go. And we're having our best year ever and our, our best month. But part of that is that we're getting way better at, at what we do, marketing the marketing aspect of it. You know, I, I think it's, it's just an interesting business model that you have. And let me get this straight or that I understand that you all are, you're purchasing a commercial property. You all are able to purchase it without financing. Uh, and then, and then you're selling the shares to investors who want to own part of that uh, property. Right. right. Um, exactly. You know, yeah. Uh, and that's a, such a, a neat business model. And can you just speak to see that business model versus uh, for versus, you know, an operator that puts leverage on every property and why you all would structure it that way? Well, uh, there's a place, you know, somebody who's 45 years old has a much different risk tolerance uh, and the ability to recover from a catastrophic event than somebody who is 65 or 70 years old, right? And so we focus on, a, on, a, on the person who, who has a very low risk tolerance, somebody who says, I want a stable income. I don't want to speculate on... Uh, appreciation. I don't want to take the risk of leverage. I just want an income stream. Uh, you know, I just, I just want to live comfortably. I want to go to Hawaii. We, we have a lot of people who will, who have built um, sweat equity into a duplex when they were 40 years old, right? They've paid it off. And now they're 65, 70 years old and their wife is saying, hey, let's go on a trip. Well, we can't. I got to repaint the bedroom or I got to change out the carpet to, to really stay with the income stream. They got to remain active and they're just tired of that. Right. So we change hassles for happiness. And so we we will quite often we have a lot of people who who sell their their single family rentals for a four and a half cap and invest with us at a six cap take that 50% return increase and uh, take off to Hawaii because the only thing they have to do is make sure the check lands in their account every day. Love that. Yeah. So, you know, Kevin, over your career and where you're at now, what's been the hardest part of this commercial real estate journey for you? Uh, the hardest part, you know, maybe I'm facing it right now as it relates to reverse syndications or this tick model. I'm facing it right now with the hotel project that I told you about. But overall, maybe the hardest part of, of uh, my uh, commercial real estate journey, um, I'd say uh, 2009 was really tough, right? Uh, that's where I saw a lot of really smart uh, developers who were using leverage 
in 2007, eight, uh, that it, because acceleration in the market was never gonna, appreciation was never gonna end and they were leveraging way too high and then all of a sudden 2009 hit. I saw that, I, I saw people experience that pain and go through that bankruptcy. As a broker, I, I was between projects, so I was, I, I was but as a broker, I, you know, it was really tough to do deals, right? So I think that was the toughest place that I saw. I mean, that, that recession was driven by lending policies, right, that affected both residential development and commercial development. And that was really the impetus for the crash, um, lending policies around real estate. So that's been the toughest time in my career. So after seeing, you know, that living through that, seeing all those people struggle, um, you know, how do you prepare, you know, for a, a downturn now? I don't go into debt. I knew that was going to be part of your answer. <laughs> That's a great way. That is a great way. Any other ways that you suggest other operators prepare or be prepared for a downturn? Uh, minimize your leverage. You know, be, be prepared for, for crud because it's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and uh, look at, look at as, as you analyze a project, who could have imagined that, that this coronavirus would hit and we would shut down an economy. I, I never would have imagined this. But fortunately, I was not heavily invested in restaurants. Oh man, that would be, uh, you know, that would be really, really tough, right? Even right. Starbucks, a stellar triple net leased investments, like triple net leased investments. And, and some of your uh, listeners may not know, the, the secret of triple net leased investment is that the tenant takes all the responsibilities. So we don't have to pay insurance. We don't pay taxes. We don't pay for the roof replacement. We don't, the tenant takes care of that. So it's very common in retail segments because the retailer is willing to do that to keep his image up and have the perfect location. So it's very popular in retail. Um, but that's our secret. Is one of our secrets is triple net lease. And Starbucks was the uh, darling of triple net leased investments, right? And one week to two weeks after the, the shutdown, you know, they're headquartered in Seattle. Seattle was an early flashpoint, right, of, the, of COVID virus. And Starbucks just went out to all their owners and said, we want a, a year abatement of rent. And it was like, oh my gosh, right? Right. Uh, wow. Starbucks, right? Um, so, uh, you know, they're paying some heavy consequence for having made that move now. Uh, they're, you know, they used to trade in the four caps. Now they're trading in the fives and that'll affect the cost of development for them moving forward. So I think it was a mistake on their part, but, um, uh, and, and a lot of property owners pushed back and it wasn't as bad, but that, that shook the industry. That scared us. Fortunately, I wasn't in any restaurant. We, we were a lot in, um, in suburban markets, banks, uh, uh, medical, pharmacy, uh, discount dollar stores, auto stores, those kinds of things that when the depression was, so we try to avoid fighting with, um, with the, the online uh, Amazon, right? Right. And then uh, we try to avoid that fight. And we also try to avoid, uh, you know, uh, economic downturns, right? So where do you spend your money when the economy goes bad? You still spend it on healthcare. You still spend it on groceries. You still spend it on drugs. So we try to uh, auto parts, you know, so there are certain places that we go. Like right now, I won't buy a gas station because I think Elon Musk is way too smart. Um, I really, I mean, what am I going to do with a Jiffy Lube trades really, really low right now, right? But this is part of investing in commercial real estate. What am I going to do when that 15 year lease is up and everybody's driving electric vehicles and nobody lubes a car anymore? I've got a great retail presence with a hole in the ground. Yeah. Technology's right. moving way too fast for 15 year, 15 yeah. year lease. And yeah. So, so, you know, we, we try to look ahead. We have a very knowledgeable research base uh, and uh, you know, that's what we do. Nice. Well, you know, 
you know, I feel like, you know, most or majority of people who have had uh, great success in, in any business, but uh, especially in, in our industry, uh, have, you know, just great self-discipline. I like to ask, you know, is there a way that you have uh, improved your self-discipline or maybe a few things that you're very disciplined about that you're, you do consistently that have helped you to, uh, you know, achieve the success that you have? So uh, my partner, my financial partner is a fellow by the name of Tom Smith. Tom Smith uh, was a co-founder of Partners in Leadership and co-author of a series of New York Times bestselling books, uh, the most popular of which and the one that is most directed to individuals is a book called The Oz Principle. And I commend that book to everybody. Uh, it is a life-changing approach to how you look at issues. And one of the principles I'll share with you, and it's probably uh, my secret to success is that there's a line, uh, the line is what we call it, the line. Thoughts beneath the line is Whitney screwed it up. Uh, you know, I, I was late getting to work today because of traffic. Um, it's not my fault because those are all below the line aspects, right? The line is the problem, right? So I want to see the problem. I want to come up with the solution. I then want to make a plan to address that solution. And then I want to implement that plan. So I want to function above the line, asking myself, how do I do that? And that's how uh, success comes to people. Um, some people refer to it as a positive attitude, uh, but really it's staying above the line and saying, what can I do to make this situation better? And that is the secret to success. Great answer. I love that. Thank you for sharing that very much. We'll definitely look that book up, The Oz Principle. Um, so what's a way that, or something that you all have done recently to improve your business that we could also apply to our business? Oh, um, I believe that something is not worth doing if it's not done excellently. Um, I spent a lot of years in, uh, in public relations and lobbying, uh, represented the timber industry in the Pacific Northwest, uh, and, and how that transitions into real estate is kind of a weird transition. But, but I had a really good friend who was a lobbyist for uh, herbicides, and uh, he had over his desk the phrase, perception is reality. And so... I think my counsel to people is you are always auditioning. You are always being judged. We're told not to judge, right? Uh, uh, judge not that you be judged, what, you know, that, all that good stuff. And that's true. But the reality is we're always judging. We're always assessing somebody. And so everything that you put forth is a uh, people will judge it. Uh, I have a, a family that loves college football and theater. And, uh, and in the theater world, it's, you're always auditioning. You're always auditioning. Uh, it's great to remember that, no doubt about it. Uh, what's your best source right now for meeting new investors? Uh, uh, we try to, I've been, uh, two, two sources. So for our 1031 exchange uh, clients, our best source is we uh, scour the um, numerous databases for uh, people who have for sales by owners and for, for agents who have, we work, we work through real estate agents. We pay the best commissions in the market because I used to be the broker, one of the largest commercial real estate principal brokers in the United States uh, running CBC advisors. And so um, the, uh, uh, we, we pay a, a really healthy real estate commission and work with real estate professionals. So we try to find those who have small investment properties listed. You know, if somebody's got $20 million uh, coming out of investment, they, you know, they'll go get an advisor and they'll do this themselves. But somebody who's got $4 million, $2 million, $1 million, $500,000, they need us. Uh, and, and so we try, we, we are able, we're very good at finding them. Uh, and then we have a, a young group of, uh, you know, I call them warriors, but uh, young sales reps who uh, just pound the phones and work tirelessly and, 
and we get in front of people. Knowing what you, you know now and after all the deals you've done and different types of structure and partners and different industries and real estate, uh, what would you have done different now, say, on your first commercial real estate deal? <laughs> uh, I would have worked harder. I've, I have learned uh, that there is no exchange for hard work. I grew up on a farm. Uh, I was a, a middle child. Um, uh, so my older brother did most of the hard work. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, early in my career, I thought things just landed on the table, right? But they don't, uh, it takes hard work. And that's one of the things I try to share. We, we have a mentorship program. We work with Colliers International. We list all our properties through Colliers International. We're the only product of this type that's on a national commercial real estate platform. And with Colliers, again, in conjunction with Colliers, we run a training, an agent training program. These are the young uh, stripling warriors that I call them uh, that are out uh, pounding the phones for us every day. Um, and we teach them how to be commercial real estate agents. And so we teach them to stay above the line and to work. And there's no exchange for work, right? I think it was Woody Allen that said 80% of success is showing up, right? It's work hard and then work a little harder. Great answer. Great answer. Uh, so, and maybe this is the answer to the next question as well, but the, what's, what would be the number one thing that's contributed to your success? Prayer. Hmm. I, I, you know, I, I, I am an extremely blessed individual and I, and I, you know, it would be really cool to say, Oh, it's hard work and intellect, but it's, I, I'm blessed. And how do you like to give back? Oh, I, I, mean, I love to give back. I have a foundation, uh, the Jason Long foundation. Uh, I, my wife uh, loves children and uh, we have nine children. Uh, but one of my middle, ch and, and they're quite old, right? They're 21 to 41 in age, right? Uh, but I had a, a middle son in the middle who was a college football player uh, and was serving his church when he was 19 years old, went out to serve his church. And while he was serving his church, he was diagnosed with leukemia, mm. passed away a year later. So we have the Jason Long Foundation uh, and we, uh, you know, we have a, 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 a uh, scholarship, uh, college scholarship uh, for a football player at BYU that we've endowed. Uh, and then we, we sponsor Christmas at the Huntsman. So the Huntsman family, many of you have heard of John Huntsman Jr. He ran for president. And then of course, Huntsman Chemical. They used their family wealth, much greater than my family wealth, right? Uh, way greater, right? Um, uh, to create the Huntsman Cancer Institute. Uh, it's where my son was treated. Uh, but we, we give back to that institution uh, with Christmas at the Huntsman every year. So every year we show up at the, Christmas, uh, at the Huntsman on Christmas Eve, we carol, uh, and we give every patient gifts, and we give cool stuff to the, to the uh, Huntsman caregivers, right? Nice. So that's, that's what we do. That's our big give back, I guess. Wow. Well, Kevin, I'm grateful for you sharing that and just giving back in that way and just, just sharing with us today, just from your level of experience over many years and in different parts of the industry and your success. I'm just very grateful for your time and, and really laying out how you all help investors and, and how you all, uh, you know, uh, minimize the risk in such a way and go through the safety and security, stability. Love that. Uh, and just walking through the tenant and common process and, and how you all have implemented that in your business. Uh, you know, Kevin, how can people get in touch with you? You and learn more about Mill Creek Commercial? MillCreekCommercial.com uh, is uh, our website. Uh, it's uh, an awesome website. Uh, and if you want to get a hold of me directly, you can uh, email me at Kevin at MillCreekCommercial.com. Uh, and uh, Whitney, in closing, let me tell you and all of your listeners and the people watching this, stay above the line and work your guts out and then work a little harder. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. 
Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.